We're in a story that's moving up. God's always about lifting. You look all through the scripture. He lifted me out and he lifted me up. He led us out and he led us up. Even the holy city of Jerusalem, it's up. It's on the top of a mountain. You go up to the holy city. You go up to Zion. You lift your eyes up to the hills from where your strength comes from. We're in a story of moving up and out with God. And Christ is in that story with us. In fact, he knows the highs and the lows of life, but ultimately Christ is in the highest place today. And we see that in his word. We see he has been lifted up, came in the flesh, but now lifted up out of death into everlasting life. And in Paul's prayer, Ephesians 1, he's helping us understand that we're linked in with Christ. So that's going to be key for you today. Are you linked to Christ? Not do you belong to a denomination or do you own a Bible or was your grandmother a follower of a certain faith? But what about you? Have you put your faith in Jesus like we saw with Joanne and um, this amazing uh, set of sisters and this brother in Wisconsin today? Have you put your faith in Jesus. And if so, you're linked to him. And Paul's trying to help you see what you're linked to. And he comes to the end of this prayer and he says, that power, he's talking about the power that's in us now, is like the working of his mighty strength. This is the end of verse 19. Going into verse 20, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him, that's our key and operative word, up, raised him, from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So when we talk about above and beyond, we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the gospel. We're talking about God's story. God is always moving above and always going beyond. And no one has done that more than Jesus. And where is Jesus now? He has been raised up, seated above, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that could be given. Title in this age and titles in the age to come. He has the highest place. But then in the next chapter, Paul wants to see that you're also up if you're in Christ. It says in verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us what? Do you see it? He, say it with me. He raised us what? Up. That's the gospel. He raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And we know where Christ is in the heavenly realms is far above all rule and authority. So the, the moment you put your faith in Jesus, you're connected to Jesus up story, his resurrection story. And spiritually right now, as far as your position in Christ with God, you're up as high as you can go up, seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You are right now in the above and the beyond in Christ right now. But the reality is we're living in 2020 and it's crazy town. And before 2020, we already had the highs and the lows of life. And you might be saying today, well, Louis, it's great that I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority. But where I am in my life right now feels really low. Where I am in my story right now feels really down. It feels like I'm at the bottom of life and not at the top of life. And that's because on this planet, there are peaks and valleys. On a broken world, there are highs and lows. There's joy and sorrow. And that's the story of our lives. That was the story of Jesus' life. Jesus came from the highest of heights. He, he was eternally up until he chose to come all the way down to be born in a manger in Bethlehem. Well, once he was born, his very presence was a threat to the rulers. And so an edict went out that all boys born in this area under a certain age would be killed. And so 
Mary and Joseph did what? They took Jesus down to Egypt. On a map where Jesus is born, Bethlehem, go south down to Egypt. And so he's been up as high as you can be, but now he's come down to the manger of Bethlehem and his first outing is down into Egypt. But he comes back up and he comes back and he establishes a ministry and he has highs and he has lows. He has days where he's applauded and days where he's a villain, days where people think he's the greatest thing that ever happened and days where he's attacked for doing something kind to someone else. And here he is in the highs and the lows. On one occasion, it says in Matthew 17 that he goes up a high mountain and he takes Peter, James, and John with him. And as he's on the mountain, he's transfigured, which simply means his glory is revealed. His face begins to shine radiant like the sun. And the whole mountain now is covered by the glory of God. And Moses appears and Elijah appears. And Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are having a conversation on this mountain in the middle of the promised land. And Peter and James and John are just floored by it all. And they say, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. We should stay right here. And Peter suggests right away, because he's the one with all the great ideas, we'll build a a shelter for you, Jesus, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, and we'll just stay here for the rest of our lives. And as he's saying that, a bright cloud descended on Jesus, and a voice out of heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And Peter, James, and John, the text said, fell on their faces, terrified by the glory of God on the mountain. That's what we call, if you grew up around church, a mountaintop experience. It was so great. I saw God so clearly. I felt so close to him. All of us were in that same spirit. It was just one of those moments where you sense God like you'd never sensed him before. And We want to stay on that mountaintop, but none of us ever did. Eventually, we all came back down into the valley. And Jesus says, as they're on their faces, don't be afraid. And then listen to his words. He said, don't tell anything about anybody about what you've just seen. You're thinking, why not? This was the greatest show on earth. We've got to let people know there's there's an unbelievable glory attached to your life. He said, don't tell anybody, because just like I told you, I've got to be handed over to the authorities, and I'm going to give my life for you. I'm coming down off the mountaintop, and I'm going all the way down to kneel in the Garden of Gethsemane and say yes to the plan of God for you. I'm going to be lifted up on a cross because if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. But then I'm going to be taken down off the cross in a hurry before sundown and put in a borrowed tomb. And once I go in the borrowed tomb in the spirit, I'm going to go down into the depths of the earth. But then by the power of God, I'm coming up from the grave, conquering death, hell, and sin. And then from the Mount of Olives, I'm going to ascend up into heaven and be seated at the right hand of God, far above all rule and authority, power, and dominion. And I'm going to have a title that's greater than any title in this age or the age to come. Jesus' life was a lot of ups and downs. It was a lot of peaks and valleys, but his life ended on a high note. He is now seated in the highest place. And your life probably looks a lot like that. See, see, putting our faith in Jesus doesn't give us a pass on easy street. We are going to have 20, 20 moments in our whole life, maybe not as pronounced as what we're in the middle of right now. And in this year, it's total up and down. It's like, oh, okay, things are getting better. Oh, no, things aren't getting better. Oh, I think we're maybe through it. Oh, no, we're really not through it. Oh, I think I'm going to make it. Oh, actually, I'm not really sure if I'm going to make it. And our lives are just up and down. It used to be YOLO. You only live once. Here we all are. Somebody take a photograph. Man, we we are living our best life right now. Hashtag YOLO. Here we are, trip of a lifetime. YOLO. 
Here we are, greatest day of all, YOLO. But somehow in 2020, YOLO has turned into yo-yo. It's up and then down. And while we're down, all of a sudden, maybe we're going to be back up. And then as soon as we think we're going up, we're back down. And this is the rhythm of life. And what God wants to say today is this, in the ups and downs, the highs and the lows, the peaks and the valleys, the mountaintops and the desperate nights of life, you need to know this, A, you're already seated high above all rule and authority, and ultimately, you're going to end on a high note. Ultimately, you're going up with God, and his plans for you are to lift you up and to move you out, to take you into the above and beyond, which you already are in, in Christ, but to see that realized as you follow him in your life. But in the process of that, you're going to have to trust God that he has a plan, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation in your life. See, a lot of us today are going, I love that it's above and beyond Sunday at Passion City Church. And I'm, I'm glad we're in an above and beyond gospel story where Jesus actually went above what anyone else would do and went beyond where anyone else would go so that we could all be standing in this moment as the sons and daughters of God. But right now, your story maybe feels more like under and behind than above and beyond. And that's the reality for a lot of us in life right now. That was the reality for one of the precious people in our house this week. Um, the person who is uh, far away from family, living in our city, um, just right on the poverty line, in and out of homel homelessness in practical terms, very few friends, very difficult life, obstacles and hardship for their whole life. Person goes into the hospital a few days ago with COVID-19 and is texting one of the few friends that she has saying they're going to put me on a ventilator in 45 minutes and I'm afraid. And there she is alone. No one can be in the hospital. Family far away in another state. A life of hardship and difficulty and 45 minutes away from the unknown. And then we got the message a day later that she was gone. Hardship. But she had found Jesus and the love of God and experienced that in this house. And in that moment that she came to the end of this earthly life, her last move was a massive vertical move straight into the embrace of Jesus. In the end, up into the arms of God, her life ended on a high note because even in death, God lifted her up into everlasting life and her eyes saw what she could never fully even imagine on this earth. You may be thinking, there is no plan. I, I cannot see God working in the situation that I'm in right now. It, it is not all above and beyond, Louis. It's mostly under and behind. I feel like I'm underwhelming right now. I feel like all my hopes right now are underwhelming. I feel like I'm understaffed at my business. I'm underfunded in the projects I'm trying to move forward. I'm underprepared for what I'm faced with and coping with right now. I feel like I'm underappreciated by the people around me and I feel behind. I'm literally behind on my bills right now. I'm behind on my timetable. I'm behind on my goals. I thought I would be at a different stage of life right now. I thought the picture of me would look different by now than it does. I'm a little bit behind on the promises that I made for 2020 and all the plans and the dreams and the vision that I had for what this new decade was going to be. And here we are halfway in to the first year of a new decade, the roaring 20s, and I'm already way behind on what I thought God was going to do in my life. But I want to remind you today that God's still got a plan. And the plan is to take you up, to build you up, to lead you up, to lift you up, to set you up. But that plan might take time 
We're talking today about the long way up. And our text comes out of Exodus chapter 13. And in this text, God has done a miracle and he is freeing his people from the power of Egypt. And as we pick up the story in verse 17, we find something a little bit interesting. And this is normally the case with the way that God works in our lives. Notice what it says in verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. And the Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. They were so euphoric that they were leaving Egypt that they were like, let's go. We're ready. We're ready to go where? To go up because from Egypt, the promised land was north and we're going to go straight up to the promised land. We've been here for ages. Now it's time to arrive at the place God says we're going to be. But as they left Egypt, instead of going up, God said, no, we're going to go sideways for a minute. And they're like, wait a minute. Did, 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 I, think, I think where we're headed is that way. And God says, I know, but right now you need to go this way. And maybe that's what you're feeling today. Maybe you feel like your life is going sideways when you thought God promised you that it was going to go up. But God's still taking you up, but he's going to take you a different way. And maybe you're on that desert road. That desert road could look like a road you didn't anticipate, a road you wouldn't have chosen, a road that you don't understand. But God says, we're going to go this way. And by the way, we're going straight into a water hazard. It looks like a setup and a trap. It looks like it's a dead end street. But we're going to go this way, sideways. Why? Here's the deal. Guys, I know you're excited, but you're not ready. I know you think you're ready, but you've been making bricks and not fighting battles, and you're not ready. These Philistines, they're fierce. In fact, they're going to be a nemesis for a long time to come in the future. There's a guy coming named Goliath, and he's going to make the whole army of Israel shake in their boots on a hillside until one anointed shepherd boy shows up for the glory of God and takes him down. These Philistines are fierce, and they're relentless, and they're brazen, and you're not ready for that yet. So I'm going to take you sideways over here so that you can watch me part the Red Sea. You can see that I can work miracles. You can understand that I can provide for you in any situation. Manna, once it falls out of the sky, you're going to go, God has got us. When the quail are on the ground, you're going to go, God does miracles. When your clothes don't wear out, you're going to go, this is unbelievable. And as I provide and sustain you, under pressure and in a difficult environment, you're going to learn that I am the Lord your God and that I can do anything. And when you get ready to move through the Philistine land on your way to the promised land, you're going to go, hey, these guys are no match for our God. So we're going to go sideways to go up because I want to do something in you before we go forward. And maybe that's what is missing in our lives right now. Maybe we're saying, God, I knew this was going to be over by June. I was sure this was going to be done once the summer came. I knew we wouldn't be doing this again for another school year. I already had anticipated my company would be up and running by now. I thought I would be back to work. I thought all these circumstances would be different. I had a different timeline in mind. Up to me looks like this. And God is saying, I know, but you need to be asking a question right now. God, are you making me ready for something else that's coming in the future? Do you know that Maybe what I don't know, that the timing isn't right and this is actually going to end up being a blessing for me. This is going to be something that you use in my life to prepare me for something in the future. So I'm going to stop fighting it and I'm going to stop running from it and I'm going to ask you, God, is this a sideways move of God on the way to and up that I can't really fully appreciate right now? And if it is, do everything you want to do in my life in this moment. Because God's ultimate plan is up. 
Your ultimate destination is up. Your final destination, way, way up. In an instant, up. But right now, God wants to do something in you so that then he can set you up to do something through you now and in the future. The text goes on to say in verse 19, Moses, and this kind of is a little bit of an interesting left turn if you don't have all the context. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. And this is what Joseph said. He said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up, up, there's the word, up with you from this place. Now, why is that stuck in the middle of the text right here? Because Joseph, he was a man of great faith, but Joseph also went on one of the craziest sideways journeys of anyone in the Bible. Joseph, you remember the coat of many colors, the youngest of Jacob's sons, the favorite of his father, this dream that he didn't ask for. His brothers, he says, and his parents are going to bow down to him. He sees it in the dream. He, he doesn't you know, want that dream necessarily, but that dream comes to him from God. And he kind of makes a little bit of a mistake by telling his brothers and his parents, this is the dream I had and not just keeping it to himself and letting God work it all out. It makes his brothers hate him all the more. And so they decide they want to take Joseph out. And so the father sends Joseph, 17 years old, to take supplies to his brothers out in the fields. And as he goes out, to his brothers. They see him coming. They devise a plan. We're just going to take him out right here. They're a little bit conflicted. And so while they talk it over, they grab their brother, their own brother, and they throw him in an empty well. Where? Down. They decide, okay, let's don't kill him because we don't want that on us. And here comes a band of gypsies down the road. They, they think, hey, better plan. We'll sell them to the gypsies and then we'll kill an animal, put the blood on the coat and we'll give that to dad and say, we don't know what happened. So they, they bring him up out of the well. He probably thinks that's a win. I'm, I'm back up now. But as soon as he gets up, he realizes they're selling him to the Ishmaelites and guess where they're going? Hello? They're going down to Egypt. And so there goes Joseph down to Egypt. He gets there and is sold to a man named Potiphar, who's the head of the guard for the Pharaoh. And so now Joseph is in a new situation, new circumstance, didn't ask for any of this, 17 years old. But guess what it says? It says, but the Lord was with Joseph, so much so that Potiphar made him head over his house. Okay, so God works outside and over and around the circumstances. Just because you got thrown in a well by your own brothers and ended up somewhere you never saw coming doesn't mean God's anointing leaves your life or his purposes fold and fail. God was still with Joseph when he was in Potiphar's house and his anointing and favor was still on his life because the vision and the dream he gave him was still going to come to pass. And Potiphar said, you're in charge of everything here. Potiphar's wife made a move on Joseph. He was a man of integrity and he rebuffed her advance. So she devised a plan and framed him and accused him falsely while Potiphar was out of town. When Potiphar returned and heard her story, he took Joseph who'd been elevated to the top position in the house and he threw him down into the jail. But God was with him in the jail. And the chief jailer put Joseph in charge of the whole jail. Because the favor of God can't be thwarted by circumstances. The cupbearer and the baker from the Pharaoh both fall out of favor and get thrown in the jail. They both have dreams and Joseph is a dream interpreter, so he interprets the dreams. To the baker, sad news, you're done. But to the cupbearer, you're going back up and you're going to be restored. All I ask for my interpretation is that you remember me when you get back to the table of the Pharaoh. And sure enough, 
The cupbearer is restored and the text says, but he did not remember Joseph. I'm, I'm going up, I'm going up. I did the dream. Uh, the cupbearer, I, I, I'm the one that let him know. He's going back to the top. He's now at the table. All he has to do is put in a good word for me and I'm up. Oh, great. He forgot me. Woo, back down. Yo, yo. Not yo, low. Yo, yo. But then the Pharaoh has a dream. No one can interpret it. And the cupbearer says, there's a guy down in the prison. I totally forgot about this guy. He's amazing. We should get him up here. I bet he can tell you your dream. And so they call for Joseph. And in one fell swoop, he goes from the pit to the palace. Bam, up. Been going sideways for 13 years of my life. Lots of ups and downs in the 13 years. But now in one move, I'm going up to the palace of the Pharaoh. He walks in, interprets the dream. Seven years of famine followed by seven years. I mean, seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. You got to get ready, Pharaoh. You got to store in big barns because there's some tough days coming. And the Pharaoh's like, brilliant. You're in charge of it all. You figure it out. You run with it and you do it. Guess who now is second in the whole land? Joseph is up. Fills the barns of Egypt. And when the famine hits, Egypt is good. But his family back in the Northland is suffering. And what do his brothers do? They come down to Egypt to get food. And who's in charge? Their brother. He figures it out. Long story short, he saves his family, ends up bringing his whole family down to Egypt. They are now living with the blessing of the Pharaoh. They are provided for and they are saved. And at the end of the story, when Jacob dies, the brothers are like, "Uh oh, Joseph would just wait until dad was gone and we're going to be toast right now. And Joseph said, no, 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 you got nothing to worry about. What, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And he said, guys, you don't understand. I'm in God's place. God put me here. You put me in a pit, but God put me in a palace. You tried to take me out, but God had his plan all along. He was going to actually put me in. You tried to put me down, but God knew the whole time he was going to lift me up. And he said, and you know why he did it? He did it for the saving of many people. That's why I'm here right now. So you're good because God put me here so that you could be saved and that the whole world could be saved. You understand, right, that Jesus came from the line of Jacob, that Jesus came from the lineage of Joseph, that Jesus was coming from this family. So when the family was saved, Jesus' way was made. God had a plan the whole time. And what was the plan? You're going to go sideways for 13 years. But after 13 years, guess what? You're going up and you're going way up. You're going all the way to the top up because that's my purpose and plan. That vision, that dream that you have, don't let it die, even though you're going sideways. And so at the end of the day, just like he suspected, God is going to come to the aid of his people because all of Joseph's brothers settled in Egypt and then their descendants settled there and their descendants settled there. But there came a day when there was a new Pharaoh in town and he didn't know anything about Joseph and he oppressed the people of God. And now time has gone by. And it's time for God to deliver the people and to bring them up out of Egypt. And Moses is on the scene. Deliverance is in motion. We're going sideways, but ultimately we're going up to where God promised that we were going to be. And guess what's going with us? The bones of Joseph are going with us because he knew sooner or later God's taken me up. And the last thing he said to his brothers, just promise me this, when God shows up, take my bones up with you. And then he died. That's faith in the sovereign purpose and plan of God. And it's understanding this last part in verse 20. So after leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. And by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way and by night a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. 
you understand that going sideways is where God teaches you and shows you that he is enough for you. See, the above and beyond isn't something God gives us. The above and beyond is God. We're we're not here today going, Lord, I, I need some above and I need some beyond. He's like, I am the above and I am the beyond and I am with you. In Christ, you are in me and I am in you. We are linked together now by faith. Inextricably for all time, we are now one. And therefore, you have access to the above and beyond at all times and in all places, whether it is on the mountaintop or down in the lowest valley night, I am there. Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, circumstance, pressure, difficulty, stress, struggle, joy, happiness, sadness, sorrow, life, death. I am there. Pillar of cloud by day, fire by night. There'll never be a moment. There'll never be a season. There'll never be any obstacle that you won't have cloud by day and fire by night. This is what you learn going sideways. And my confidence is not in my bank account. It's not in my friends even. It's not in my past or my accomplishments or my abilities or my opportunities. My confidence is in pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. The great I am who said to Moses before this whole thing unfolded, I am that I am. That is my name forever and ever for this generation and for the generations to come. Tell them my name is I am that I am. My name is pillar of fire by night, cloud by day, fire in the dark, cloud in the day. You will always have a voice and a witness in me. See, maybe you're not as ready as you think. Or maybe like Joseph, the time isn't right. Yes, you're going to save the world, basically. But that's 20 years from now when the famine hits. And I've got to position you now for a promise to be fulfilled later. And maybe you're thinking, I'm on the desert road, Louis, and I'm going nowhere. And God's like, no, you're going where I need you to be six years from now. Well, why didn't God just take me like the day before? (laughs) Exactly. Because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And he's moving more pieces on planet Earth right now than you can imagine. And he's doing it for a story way bigger than you. You're like, I want to get up. And he's like, no. God wants people to be saved. No, I just want to get up. No, God wants people to come to know him. I just need to get up. No, God just wants revival to happen. And so Paul and Silas end up at midnight in the jail, beat up for their faith sideways. We we were just going this way. And the next thing we know, we're in the down, down in the bottom of the jail. But God shows up fire by night and the whole jail shakes and the doors swing open. They rush and light torches and the jailer is ready to fall on his sword because he knows all the prisoners have escaped. And when the torches are lit, Paul and Silas are like, we're still here. We stayed. Why? Because we realized God took us sideways. And so we didn't burst out the doors first thing looking out for us. We sense the Lord wants us to stay and wait till you got here. And the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And his whole family got baptized that night. Salvation came just like with Joseph. This isn't all about me. This is about the world. This isn't all about me. This is about the saving of many people. This isn't all about me. This is about other people in the story. So God, am I ready? God, is the timing right? Because I know I'm going up. God, am am I believing and trusting that even in death, you're going to move me on? Even if I don't see it in this lifetime, you're going to move me on in your story. Am I at that place in life that I'm confident God's going to come through fire by night, cloud by day? God's coming through for me. And if we can learn that, I believe 2020 can turn around for us. And maybe that's the story today. Maybe we're not going to circle this as crazy town and say this was the the worst year of all. Maybe we're going to circle it and go, God was in it. 
God was a part of it. God was doing something. He was shaking things up. He was setting things up. And God was in 2020. I see it and I believe it. And I'm going to start speaking that into my story. Cloud by day, fire by night, the above and the beyond. But it's, I believe, down here in the valley where all the work is done that makes us who we are in the highs and the lows of life, especially once God has lifted us up to a place of influence, a place like Joseph was in, where he could have quickly taken revenge, he could have quickly settled a score, but God had done something in him in the lows. And I wonder if you maybe today could just say, Lord, I, I want to I want to be faithful right here at low tide because I'm 100% sure the tide is coming in. At Wednesday night prayer a few weeks ago, we were just opening up for prayer request and the chat just blew up as it does on Wednesday nights with maybe hundreds of prayer requests. Just scrolling by so fast you can't see them. Our team's screen grabbing them all so we can pray for them after the fact. And one of them just went really fast, but a lot of us on our team saw it and it just simply said, I need new tires for my car. And so the next day the question was raised, who, who is this person? Does anybody know this person? Are they linked into our house? What's the story? And it turns out they are linked into our house. And we reached out through their community group leaders and made contact with them. And by Friday, that was Wednesday night, by Friday, this is the story. Um, yes, I've been through a hard time, uh, a little behind on bills and um, desperately needed tires for my car. I thought, okay, I'm just gonna go out there, even though it seems like a small thing, and I'm gonna put it in the chat at Wednesday night prayer. And lo and behold, Thursday, something happened and I was able to catch up on my bills and get new tires. And on Friday, I got a substantial raise at my job. And we are like, Wednesday night prayer. Are, are we praying enough right now? It's like being in this building today. Uh, Thursday, this is Sunday. Thursday, we weren't going to be in this building. Just circumstances around the situation. And it didn't look likely. And we were in our all team. And Jonathan was giving us a report. And he said, there's still a small chance, but uh, we need someone to call us back actually right now during this all team meeting. And so we stopped right there and we prayed. We just said, God, we're just trusting you, believing in you, cloud by day, fire by night, that kind of prayer. We went on and Pastor Ben was with us and he shared an amazing devotion with our team and encouraging all of us in the season as he finished pitching it back to Jonathan. Jonathan said, well, Evan, who's uh, our a team member who's been overseeing this project from the building standpoint, just got a phone call while Ben was talking and uh, we're gonna be in the building on Sunday. They're gonna work it out. And we are standing here right now from a simple prayer of saying, God, if you could part this sea, we'll walk through it. And so into the chat, I need new tires and God moves. And I'm curious, I wanna know what happened on Thursday. Like something happened on Thursday, I was able to pay my bill. So we reached out again. What happened on Thursday? Here's the story we got back. I'm relatively new to Passion City Church. This person said, 46 years old. I've known Jesus for a while, but I needed a change in my life. And I really leaned in and said, God, I want 2020 to be that year that I have a turnaround in my faith with you. And so the person goes into 2020 and says, I'm giving at Passion City Church, but I'd never in my life made the decision to consistently, faithfully tithe every pay period. And so I made that decision in April while I was on 75% of my salary during quarantine, every week, tithing. Said by June, I was back up to 100% salary and I bumped up my online giving to match my new 100% salary but I was behind on my bills from being at 75% and I prayed every day on my 50 mile drive to work that my tires would make it 
that God would take care of me, but I was gonna keep tithing no matter what. She said that on Thursday, she emailed the owner of the place where she works because their company often would give um, emergency loans to people that they could pay back over time on a payroll deduction. And she said that the owner said, the company can't do it right now. But after the owner thought about it, the owner said, but I'm gonna do it personally. And he walked in and gave her the $3,000 that she needed. She paid her bills, got caught up, got the new tires for her car, and then got a raise on Friday. And she was so thrilled that down in the low where she'd made the commitment to trust God, that now God had come through in a provision for her life. And you know, the most beautiful thing is I love the heart of that business owner. It's a way to go for just extending that kindness that you didn't have to do. But when some people in our house heard that story, they said, wow, that is so kind of that business owner to extend that loan to her, but we'd like to take it one step further. And they all chipped in. And Kathy, I just wanna tell you that tomorrow, by the end of the day, you're gonna receive another $3,000 check that's gonna be coming to you from some people in our house. There won't be a payroll deduction for you to pay back that check because it is a gift from people who are honored by your story and moved by your faith. It is God's above and beyond coming back to you. So your debt will be paid. Your business owner will have his money back on Tuesday and you will be able to go forward trusting God into this new above and beyond season, knowing that he sees you and he is with you, cloud by day, fire by night. God is gonna provide and is now providing for you. And I am so thrilled. I wish I could deliver it personally, but it comes with all the joy of our house. And sure, it'd be great if we could do that for every single person in Atlanta, but we can do it for one. And maybe there's someone in your sphere of influence that you know a need in their life right now when God is saying, I can be a part of the above and beyond. God has been above and beyond with me. I can be a part of the above and beyond for this person because this is the kingdom of God and it is what we are standing in today. It's a God who cannot be stopped, whose plans cannot be thwarted. And even though it may look sideways today, it's going to end up going up and you're going to end on a high note with God. It's the kingdom. It's who he is. It's what he does.